applications quite easily from a central location. Now, when this comes to edge, the developer will have to run hundreds and hundreds of these workloads across data centers, across regions, across countries, or maybe beyond. And then there could be so that there are multiple service providers, so they might have to run variants of these same applications on multiple service providers' edges. So, for example, operator one has has a different kind of cloud, operator two has another kind of cloud, and they might have to modify, uh, change their SDKs or whatever to develop these applications individually for multiple operators. So suddenly when you start multiplying this by thousands and then you multiply with the number of operators, then uh, this becomes a little uh, economically unviable. And the fact that if you if you if you are running it as a server in each of these edge and all the devices are connecting to that server, then you have to have to run the server even if there is one device using it. So for example you have an AR glass. You have made an application for an AR glass and there are hundred edges. And if there are at least one user connected to that edge, you still have to run that server. So now multiply this uh, for 365 days, 24/7. Suddenly, the the cost becomes much much larger than what he is he is incurring today on the public cloud. Plus, the public cloud, because of its scale, the cost itself is low. But when you go to the service provider's edge, the cost would be much higher. And the fact that you might have to run thousand times many workloads. This becomes a problem. <clears throat> so, so the cost per workload for a developer in edge compute is significantly high, or is at least projected to be significantly high when you compare that to public cloud. And so, some kind of new new mechanisms required. I mean, some kind of architectural platform solutions are required where perhaps you can run a container for each device. I mean, it's not intuitive, but you can. Say, for example, you have an AR glass. You are wearing a glass. You switch on the application. A container gets spawned, which serves the glass, and then you switch it off. The container goes away. So you can actually try and figure out a cloud native model to have a one-to-one -one mapping of microservers with architect with 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 the devices. Uh, but that that would mean that we are sort of sacrificing multi-tenancy. We have sacrificing the possibility of collaboration between glasses, collaboration between devices. Uh, how do you do notification? Uh, how, which these are all features which a server architecture would have provided. In 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 a in a microserver architecture, a microservice architecture, as they call it, if if we are going to run this faceless application for a few seconds or a minute, uh, stateless applications, and if you want to collaborate in a multiplayer gaming where two persons are playing the same game and they're not connected to a common server, they all have their own uh, for the duration they are playing, then this this might not work. So therefore, there must be an additional need for the from the platform perspective to provide capabilities to do messaging, to do notification, to support multi-tenancy, to have this subscription publication kind of models built in, so that these devices can actually start to access it more from a more like a server, but it's still running like in a in a faceless uh, microservice model. So that's that's one of the key challenge. If you look from the end-to-end -end perspective, all the edge compute goes uh, becomes inviable if there if, it, if the developers find it too costly. So, so some models are required perhaps to solve that. Then, if you look at the kind of applications that require slow latency, whether they are AI workloads or say a face recognition or something similar. <clears throat> or say an object recognition, or you're doing some kind of speech translation, or uh, this re may require hardware, uh, require hardware accelerators like GPUs. Uh, they are power hungry. Uh, <clears throat> they have a huge envelope of power requirements. Uh, they uh, they again pushes up the edge compute uh, significantly, uh, edge compute cost significantly up, and th and that passes on to the developer anyway. So. Uh, so how much of these uh, accelerators are ready for prime time? Do you actually need them on edge, or you can sort of train them in cloud, infer on edge? And is, is the inference also requires GPUs? Maybe yes. <clears throat> is this actually ready for prime time? Is this too expensive? Do we have problems in, in virtualizing it? I, this, most of this is still open questions. We don't know the, the right or wrong answers. Uh, but many developers actually feel that they can really leverage low latency if they if they are if they can build these kind of applications, and most of these algorithms which drive these applications are uh, well require some kind of uh, specialized hardware accelerators. The the 
the other problem that we are looking at is the what is the right edge for a client device now imagine this situation that you are on a on a subway or on a train and you're connected to a wireless service provider's edge you're playing a game you, you reach your home you 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 connect to a different service provider over your wi-fi network and your game stops working because your workload was running in somebody else service provider's network right uh, and you can't access the game anymore uh, unless of course these two providers are the same providers and they have some collaboration and and and, and those are a bit complexities from the operator's perspective but a, a, an application developer can provide today a seamless experience to their end consumer if they run it on public cloud. I mean, if you are using a public network, you are sitting in a Starbucks, you are at home, or you are in your, using a mobile phone, you are in a subway, or in a bus, or a train, you can still access the application. Uh, if, if you take that, that flexibility out from edge compute, then most likely the developers will have a second thought of building applications for edge compute. So A, we have to figure out the right edge, edge compute dynamically, whether, and this need not necessarily be service provider network always. It could be a local network or the city network, city data center. It could be even be the public cloud based on location. So there must be a way to discover the right edge or you must be able to provide a seamless experience to the end user uh, based on location, latency, maybe hardware capabilities that the application requires, capacity of the of the of the edge compute in question, and on all of the above, maybe. So that's the other problem that uh, perhaps we need to solve as a community. Uh, and then, as I was talking about in in edge compute, in, today mostly we are downloading data, but in edge compute we expect the devices to upload data or, or uplink have a huge uplink data now if, you, if if all the devices and all the glasses everybody starts streaming data uh, upwards towards the network then there is uh, a sudden deluge of of data and and uh, would the network be able to handle all of that maybe yes we don't know but uh, would that mean that you would need some kind of complex queuing mechanisms or complex way of handling those incoming data on, on an edge compute. Uh, well, there are some academic research going on on that, but nobody really knows how much this would impact uh, the, the, the platform architecture. Uh, whether it's it's uh, whether the current set of infrastructure solutions that we have, whether OpenStack, Kubernetes, and, and things on top of it, are they good enough to handle that? Maybe yes. But we haven't reached that stage yet where we, we can even simulate that kind of data. Uh, and and would there, are there other ways? And the, the previous speaker were talking about um, uh, serverless. Can we actually provide a mechanism to the application developer where they can seamlessly move or, or do some compute on the, on the device itself and then offload a certain computing to the device on demand. Say, for example, he wants to do a matrix multiplication of two very large matrices or wants to do some uh, image processing on a certain frame that he captured. Can he just send that part to the edge and uh, and get that computed, or does he need to send the entire thing? We'll run a thin client on the device, and the 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 heavy heavy lifting is done by the edge. Ideally, yes, but in real life, it might be complex, and it uh, from the application developer's perspective, it might be easier to do 90% of the stuff still on the device, and the 10% heavy lifting can be done on edge. Then what to offload, when to offload, and how to offload that 10% of computing from the device to edge is a critical question to get this edge compute to succeed. Uh, finally, what happens if the edge goes down? I mean, this is a question which I repeatedly hear from developers. I mean, I'm running, and the edge goes down. The connectivity to the public cloud is gone, or the connectivity to the internet is gone. Can we move the application somewhere? Can it's a stateless application? Can I launch it somewhere else immediately and get get the device to connect to it? I don't know the answer. Maybe federating computing platforms is a is a way forward. Maybe having similar computing experiences running on device, running on the same platform, a piece of the same platform at least. Uh, running on the device and the running on the edge and the running on the public cloud and you can able to federate move around client move around the workload seamlessly you can decide to run the entire application on device if there is no edge compute uh, with of course some degradation of uh, of experience say for example the AR glass can get heated up but if this if the edge is connected then you offload that to edge 
Uh, and if, for example, the edge is choked, you can move it to another edge or you move it to a public cloud. Uh, so at least the end user experience can get deteriorated, but you don't have a complete failure of, of, of the service. So in, in order to move such, have such kind of a decision making that when to run it on device, when to run it on edge, when to run it on cloud, needs a fair amount of uh, of uh, abilities uh, in this orchestration system or on the decision making system of edge compute to make that to work okay so uh, so this is a, a rough idea of what uh, what we have been uh, discussing with, with the uh, our developer community and this sort of is a developer's voice if, if, if you look at it uh, so this this slide actually talks about the same problem that I was mentioning earlier it's nothing different really uh, just it, it, it gives you a picture of the complexity so the developer is sitting somewhere here actually uh, somewhere uh, on the on the on in, in the public cloud on the internet right and he's onboarding the application to some portal which is running on the internet he definitely can't uh, directly launch an application on the edge cloud I mean he doesn't even know where the device is at that moment so first of all when he has uh, when he has onboarded this uh, his workload on the edge on on the public cloud there will be a device which will come up and then the device will have to figure out which is the right edge somehow the device will the only device knows this location at that point of time the poor developer has no clue I mean he has hundreds of devices he doesn't even know where they are so this device will have to figure out and negotiate with the network that hey this is the this is the edge which is nearest to me and maybe you need to run the run the server here or the application server here then this uh, then the service provider network will will go to the public cloud pick this workload up and then drop it here and then run it uh, and then you get this access and then this uh, then this device goes uh, goes off and then you still maybe cache the, the the software here but you, you you stop the instance and then this fellow takes a car goes to his office or, or takes a flight and goes to another city goes to another edge then again this whole rigmarole will have to start again okay you discover this is the right edge now yeah, and again, you, you pick it up from a central location, and, and you start running it here. Now, if this complexity gets, you start adding this, uh, or you multiply this with number of device users in the mass market model, uh, and this is pretty complex to solve, isn't it? I mean, for every time, you need to figure out what's the right edge. Uh, one way is that the network is the boss and can always tell the device that, hey, this is the right edge for you. Or you can dynamically figure out when the device comes up through a set of APIs, through some kind of communication handshake between the network, you can figure out which is the right device. Maybe through probes, through through a method of uh, latency measurements. Maybe it's a, uh, it's possible to empower the developer with some kind of SDKs and APIs to actually have an application logic to decide what's the right edge instead of entirely depending on the network to tell them what is the right edge. Maybe at one point of time, uh, the application decides that hey the the right edge is the public cloud and you might just run the, the the device on the public cloud itself instead of edge we don't know that we don't know that lack of enough data lack of ability to you know run this on a service provider network and figure out what is the uh, what is the right thing so it's more on paper we've done some simulations and figured out that yes this is possible to discover the edge at at uh, at runtime for the device instead of the network commanding to the device that hey this is the right edge uh, now now there, there as a, the other problem that I was talking about that there can be many edge edged platforms right there can be a, a platform uh, for operator one there could be a platform used by a, a f by an enterprise in a factory there could be another platform which might be used by an airline in in, in main, doing maintenance or doing some kind of you know uh, networking uh, applications in, in, in an airport there could be a, a connected stadium which might be using a different uh, different platform so there could be so many different possibilities of edge compute now if an application developer is asked to build hundred such different variants of the same application it might be a problem for him I mean it could not it could be too much of a cost and effort to actually maintain that many variants of the same application while he didn't have to do that if he was doing it from public cloud. 
so and, and this is a problem because there isn't any standards and there are not supposed to be any standards in, in innovative and disruptive technologies so what is it that the application developer do uh, possibly figure build applications as containers and hope for the best uh, or maybe it might be a good idea to have a developer facing services built into some kind of a portal or a marketplace as a service where the developers can sort of build their applications uh, using maybe multiple SDKs or maybe a single SDK, upload these applications to this kind of a, uh, of a developer facing service and is able to uh, do multiple things. Basically, you are able to do uh, uh, lifecycle management of the application. You can able to do lifecycle management of the developer itself. So they might be able to join, verify, test different edges, figure out what he wants to do. Uh, and, and then perhaps the most important thing is they are able to op do uh, some kind of monetization for their applications. Remember, monitoring is a major problem in edge compute. I mean, it looks simple on paper, but it's not. Hundreds and thousands of workloads, all from disparate, heterogeneous platforms, generating tons and tons of data. All of them have to be have to be analyzed by the developer to figure out what went wrong or how much money he made. So there must be a way to federate or to, to aggregate all of this and provide the developer with what he needs. How, what, what kind of monitoring data he needs from this heavily scalable applications. I mean, there are like thousands running. And what kind of diagnostics the developer required. Those are very critical things to provide. And perhaps having or working towards or collaborating in the developer services model uh, by organizations might be a good problem to solve, or might be a economic problem to solve, given that the cost per workload will go significantly up if we don't solve this problem today. Uh, the second part uh, is about uh, in, in, in a service provider network's perspective. Uh, we know that there would be the, the user uh, wireless network functions. There could be multiple data centers, a layer one data center very close to the, the base station. There could be aggregation points. There could be regional data centers. There could be central offices. And these applications will move around, I mean, based on your latency requirement. If, for example, your application can tolerate 50, 60, 70 milliseconds, but is extremely mobile, then most probably would like to move the application a little behind in the network, maybe on a central office or maybe in the regional data center, so that you don't have to worry about migrating workloads from one base station to another as the as the device moves on. So say, for example, a drone, and it's flying all over the Bay Area or, or a, a, a certain city or certain location, and you start moving uh, applications as it change, as it handovers from base station to base station, it's going to be a nightmare. So if it can sort of handle 70 milliseconds or 60 milliseconds or maybe 100 milliseconds of latency, then it's a good idea to push that application back towards the layer 2 or layer 3 data center. Uh, and you can avoid uh, this continuous uh, workload migration. But then there could be applications which might be more static in nature, but it demands low latency to an extent that uh, it has to Maybe the SLA is somewhere around 15 milliseconds or, tw or 20 milliseconds. In that case, you would have to run the application uh, in perhaps in the in the nearest in, in, uh, edge for for the device. And imagine the co the kind of computing offload would happen. So the computing offload, a device offloads it to uh, edge. If the edge is not capable or is congested, then what does it do? I mean, does it uh, drop it or it it can move it back backwards towards? Uh, central clouds or towards regional clouds or or can it offload it to a peer, uh, a nearby peer who might be relatively free. Uh, so there are some multiple models actually to figure out how do we do this workload migration or this computation offload. Can this edge just act as an anchor and you actually run the application here if this is kind of a uh, if, if, if this particular uh, edge is overloaded, maybe yes, maybe no. Uh, maybe there will be some impact on latency and what kind of SLAs the developer sign up with with the operator would actually determine that. But this is possible. This is possible to uh, technically and theoretically, it is possible to move applications from edge to a regional data center seamlessly across different edges based on what you want to do, what kind of uh, QoS you, you are required to adhere to. 
and that uh, that is uh, we have done some research on that uh, and and very soon we'll be publishing some of the details uh, that goes with it but this is a critical problem to actually to uh, to solve from the from the platform perspective uh, i think i'm running out of time so i'll i'll try to wrap up the other important problem that we faced is on edge storage uh, Say for example, you, you uh, there are certain applications which stores data, and there, the use case itself is that you, those data, if you transfer them to cloud, there is huge amount of backhaul costs, and if you if and, and you don't need all of those data, maybe you just need to analyze them and drop that data, or, or maybe you you need to use it for a short period of time, and then you don't need the data. Then what's the point in actually sending the, all those exabytes or terabytes of data to to the public cloud or where you can store it forever for perpetuity. Uh, so you might as well, you know, stop this data itself in the edge and then maybe destroy it or store it somewhere or, or use it to, 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 to do something. Um, say for example, in, a, in, in an extreme case, there is an application which, is, which requires data to be stored and then wants to reaccess the data after a while. There could be, there could be needs, say a car might. I'm just giving an example. Now, if this, uh, if if you store all of the data when he was near this edge, uh, say one of the edges, uh, say he was near this edge, and you store all the data here, and then this car uh, sort of drives off to another edge, and he wants to access the data from this edge, uh, and suppose there is no connectivity or there is no way to reach this old edge where he stored all of those data, then what do you do? Um, the, or, or suppose this edge has gone down by that time and it's out out of the network for a moment or so. Then how do you reconstruct the data? There are some ways of doing it, which we, we think is that we can actually store the data in multiple blocks and 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 using the concept of erasure code, but in a in a mode uh, not at a at a node level, but more at a data center level, where you can actually store this data in multiple different data centers uh, using uh, by breaking them into some data blocks and maybe and a couple of parity blocks, and these parity blocks could be stored in each of these uh, adjacent edges, so you can actually. Uh, store one data block and one parity block in in one data center another data block another parity block or in another data center and similarly you can distribute these blocks across different edges and when you want to reconstruct all you need is a uh, uh, the total blocks, uh, whether and but if some of the blocks are missing because the edge is out of uh, connection, uh, just having the parity blocks itself will, will help the application developer to reconstruct the stored data from which we might have stored in a different edge. Uh, so this is a, a very in interesting way of actually figuring out, uh, creating a fabric of uh, data usage. The use cases are very rare, this kind of use cases, but it's still there. The, the, some developers were looking for this kind of solution. Uh, the, so, and, and, and this uh, this can actually be accelerated for low latency. We, we have recently demonstrated that by parallelizing erasure codes, which this, this method is called erasure coding, and parallelizing erasure code across multiple data centers uh, and, and accelerating them through GPUs is actually a good idea. Uh, I think I'm totally running out of uh, time. I have five minutes left, so uh, I quickly go through a couple of important things that uh, that you might want to know, and then we we can move on to questions. Uh, the other thing that I was talking about is the device to edge offload uh, by you know offloading functions from device to edge. So suppose you are having a a, a program that you're running on the device, and the developer is writing its application on the device, and there are some functions that are too, con too in resource intensive, it maybe would drain out the battery or something, or it may not be even feasible to run that particular algorithm or, or particular function on the device, then you can actually offload that to the edge. So you might need a serverless architecture where you're sending an event uh, to the cloud saying that hey this event this is the function that i want to run and this is the this is the input data or uh, the arguments of the function and and that function gets executed on the edge and you get the response back to the device this is this is critically to understand that this is between device and edge only it's there is no way of going to cloud and coming back you can do that like this in this picture you can the device can go to an application on cloud and the application of the cloud can uh, can uh, Use the some kind of function as a service model to spawn functions parallelly. 
but at the same time, uh, it is more prudent to actually uh, offload directly to the device. So you can actually have the uh, have the device uh, somewhere here, and the device actually directly offloads the function to the function as a service of the platform, and you, you launch the function, and this function sends back the answer to the device itself. Uh, this is a much shorter loop, and, and this might be more prudent to do in a low latency environment. But then the problem is that these functions, if you use a Kubernetes, it takes 10 seconds or maybe a little less than that. To, so there's a cold start problem for such functions. So you might want to run the functions already or load these functions. Uh, in that case, what to load? Uh, what, what, what would you load? So uh, we divided these functions uh, into, into multiple layers. So there is, of course, the hardware and the software ab abstractions. There would be uh, maybe some specialized kernel modules. There could be some intelligence layers. Uh, where the actual application logic e exists uh, in in the function, uh, and of course there would be some way of some APIs to manage and handle all of these uh, orchestration pieces, and and this itself is a sort of a cell, and you might want to already start some parts of these cells when uh, when the device has, has uh, device has camped on or device has started the application. Uh, so that it can you can accelerate the function uh, function execution faster as compared to doing it from completely from cold start and it takes a few seconds then the whole idea of having low latency uh, falls apart so so there are some ways to do that you can define all of this different layers through models through an approach for stateful functions and uh, and 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 actually avoid the problem of finding a needle in the haystack because this function runs for say a few milliseconds and it goes away suppose it did something wrong how do you actually diagnose that i mean it 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 stayed alive for so little time you don't even know uh, how how uh, what happened so there must be ways to offload or, or to at least store the logs or find a way to you know diagnose such functions because hundreds and thousands of devices calling these functions randomly and 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 quickly in a very high density unless there is a way and you, you decompose these functions to multiple layers it might be very difficult to figure out what happened uh, so so these have to be defined through models and through uh, th through say a container based system Finally, this is the, perhaps the, my last slide. Uh, just to summarize, uh, we, we built this uh, reference architecture for edge compute, keeping all of these problems that I talked about. So there is the a possibility of having a marketplace and a developer experience where application developers can actually have a common interface to run applications uh, across edges, irrespective of what edge it is. Of course, this needs a fair amount of uh, federating APIs in the southbound, but that's, that's the problem we are ready to solve together with the ecosystem. Uh, there are, uh, there would of course be. Uh, uh, the, the, it looks very eerily similar to uh, to Etsy, but uh, there will be application platforms which has to have the ability to do rapid upgrades, like a DevOps model. It should be able to do to to do uh, multi edge management or discovering the right edge for the device. The application itself can be three tier. You can run something on the application client. Uh, you can you can so basically you can run something on the client you can run something on the cloud you can run some, some you can run something on the edge and you should be able to connect all of these together and run what is required where uh, because the application developer it finds it extremely expensive to run everything on edge so you might want to run only a part of it and and then of course you need to support virtual network functions you need the offloads the compute offloads uh, and and then of course you need this entire thing to have some kind of a microservice model running perhaps on containers we also plan to support uh, enhanced machine learning uh, by supporting multiple hardware abstractions and so on and so forth right so that's all from my side i i might thank you Shamik. be a minute over yeah yeah, thanks a lot. Um, we're a little bit over time, but maybe we can have uh, one question uh, from the audience. You will have to speak into the mic, um, so we'll come to you. One question from the audience, if there's any. Shamik, your presentation was so good that nobody has any questions. <laughs> uh, that, that's that's what really good. I mean, I've I've heard you talk before, but every time I hear you speak, I learn a little bit more. So, thank you very much. I know it's uh, early in the morning in India, but appreciate you dialing in and 
yeah, India. Thank you very much, today. and thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity and uh, for people listening to me patiently. Uh, thank you very much, and we'll definitely be in touch. Absolutely, thank you. All right. You. Okay, so we have our last presentation coming up. Um, so while that's getting set up, I'll, I'll introduce Krishna. So Krishna is actually a colleague of mine, so he works with me in the 5G group. He's our uh, technical architect, the lead architect for our edge uh, solution. So one of the focus areas for our group is to build an open SDK. So this SDK is, um, is open source. We are pushing it out into the you know the ecosystem with the hope that you know our developer community is able to onboard more and more of the solutions on the edge, right? So I think we all win if the edge moves fast. So um, Krishna has been with Intel about 13 years. Um, he has been, he's worked on pretty much every aspect of uh, the network side, including, um, I think, NF3, edge computing, obviously, FlexRAN. Um, and he's going to give us a talk about our MEC uh, platform as a solution. Right. Uh, hi, this is Krishna. Uh, I am working in the same group as uh, Prakash in uh, 5G infrastructure in uh, Intel uh, Network Platforms Group. Uh, I think exactly one year from today, last year, uh, I had provided uh, a training and, and the same session here in the same auditorium on our NEV SDK architecture. And we had even pro shown a demo based on FlexRAN and a drone uh, acting as a UE equipment. So what we are going to do today is uh, talk about uh, the further enhancements that we have done on our um, uh, network edge virtualization kit, which is basically enabling developers for developing apps and also for operators to deploy in their network. Uh, and, and do trials um, and we are also going to go through some of the enhancements that we have planned for the future releases. Uh, so uh, I, mean, I mean for us NEV SDK is a vehicle to basically to uh, enable application developers and, uh, and, and, and operators to do trials uh, for edge compute. And and um, and also sort of show IA as architecture of choice for edge compute. So as part of this, we use SDK as a vehicle to interact with various customers, enterprise, macro, and uh, and, and, and uh, operators. Uh, and what we understand is the term edge varies with different uh, customers with whom we engage. 
and what you are seeing is the three representation. Uh, so there is an enterprise edge view which is highlighted in uh, yellow. So that that's on the left hand corner where it's basically uh, uh, your uh, I mean enterprise applications which is uh, l limited within an organization sort of setup, and and you have uh, a CSP. CSP is cloud service provider like Amazon and Google and, um, and, 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 and Microsoft Azure and lastly COSP and that's the term that we use for communication service provider or comm service provider like uh, operators like Verizon and uh, AT&T. Right? So the, the concept of edge varies depending on the use case and the customers whom we interact. So for us, uh, SDK is the vehicle so that we can do the, let's say, the bare minimum that is needed for to kickstart the either the application development or the trial so that you can go into the commercial mode for deploying an edge solution very quickly. And that's what we do in our SDK. Right? So just a little bit of history of our releases. So uh, there have been five releases of our SDK. And, and basically uh, we had started off on Atom-based platforms and quickly moved on to Xeon-based releases uh, because of more density and the use cases that we have seen during the deployment. So for us, we have seen wherever there is sort of VRAN sort of deployments, we see uh, uh, Edge Cloud being a, a, a candidate there for deploying, deployment. And we, are, we have also seen Edge Cloud deployments where, uh, the, uh, where there is specifically just the Edge Cloud being deployed rather than requirement for having a VRAN solution. Right? So that's why we moved up to Xeon and, and, and also, uh, so Xeon class includes Xeon uh, SP, which is your uh, uh, server platforms, and also the SOC, which is based on Xeon D. Um, so, from software perspective, um, for us, we, we we need to make sure all the silicon enhancements that gets into Intel architecture are exposed to application developers, and and how do we project these silicon enhancements for? application developers for for basically the edge that's our main criteria with uh, for for this uh, sdk that we have so i um, mean you can you can recognize that from from the list of features that we support so the sdk as such edge cloud supports uh, different types of deployments uh, I, we have a diagram in the next slide where the edge cloud can sit on S1 interface. I'll uh, let you know what is S1 uh, and, and also the SGI interface. This is all in the wireless uh, uh, network architecture. We also can consume traffic from an IP network or uh, just basically Wi-Fi or wireline. And also, I mean, which means that the apps as such are agnostic to where the traffic is coming from. So that networking complexity is hidden, first of all, by RSTK. And, and uh, so the, the networking piece comes with various baggage and stuff like customers having VLAN support, VXLAN, and, and, and uh, we support all those so that uh, effectively for an application developer, he doesn't need to do much or understand much about the networking complexity. Second is because of Xeon, uh, Xeon class of uh, servers, the deployment, it is a multi-core architecture, more denser platform having hundreds, tens of hundreds of applications on the edge. So we need to make sure the compute resources and also the IO and uh, memory resources, various resources on the platform are partitioned and also allocated to these applications effectively so that they do not miss the SLA because of uh, either because of uh, uh, over subscription or misconfiguration or mismanagement of resource. 
So all these are hidden under what you see here as Wind River Optimized Telco Cloud. So which gives us precise and clear partitioning of resource which ultimately benefits application developers and operators so that if they say this particular real-time app or low latency app needs to have this much IO bandwidth, needs to have this much compute, it always gets it every time. Right? That's what is hidden behind this Wind River optimized telco cloud. And while we are working on this for Edge, we also enable various uh, uh, features that are in silicon like FPGA and stuff. We'll go, go, go through that. And we make sure that it is upstreamed into mainline OpenStack and, and also exposed as a consumable API by the, uh, by the uh, edge, uh, a, a, edge vendors, edge cloud solution vendors, you know. Uh, so we also, uh, I mean, uh, you can see at the bottom, like we also s provide as part of this SDK, uh, E Node B and EPC emulator. So if 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 a customer goes with um, full blown SDK deployment, so it's basically a mini data center based on OpenStack. So you set up that. You also have LTE network also set up. So if a customer wants to go down that route, we have that path. And if a customer who can be an application developer wants to get to writing an application very quickly, we have a simple model based on CentOS, which, which basically avoids all this other complexity. The APIs remain same. The lifecycle management remains same. They basically get the packets on the IP interface, so it, 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 it all looks transparent. So an application developed on the, a, a standalone single compute node we only need a single interface which supports dpdk and once that criteria is met it can be a, a small device like a nook uh, application developed on that should seamlessly work on a xeon class device uh, so we also added over this past year support for kubernetes cloud native deployment we are seeing more traction for this on edge cloud uh, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the architecture of microservices. So the APIs, data plane, all of them remain same between VM deployment and what we call as container or cloud native deployment. Uh, we also support AWS Greengrass and Azure. That's a big improvement over last year. So uh, again, we'll go through what does that mean. So apart from normal edge cloud apps, we can onboard these IoT gateways which were typically running on dedicated hardware. And rest of the performance tools which analyzes the uh, for application developers various uh, parameters like uh, where, is, where are your cache misses, how much power is your application consuming and uh, where is your bottleneck or hotspots, all those are exposed through the test suite and the um, and in Intel tools that are sort of bundled as part of the SDK. So that's the sort of overview of where we are today uh, from compared to last year. Um, so this is a diagram of uh, the difference between 4G and 5G networks and also how our SDK is supporting these two deployments. So one of the key takeaway with 5G is in 4G, there was no concept of edge cloud. Uh, edge cloud or MEC, right? In, in, if you go and refer to up to release uh, 14 of 3GPP, there is nothing called MEC. Uh, MEC is only part of the HC specification. Uh, and, and, and so what used to happen was for any edge cloud deployment uh, on an LTE network, Either it could have been between the base station and EPC, which is the S1 interface, which is a tunneled interface, right? And and there, uh, basically, you mean you you need to consume all the packets, look at how which app is deployed on the edge, process them. If it is not deployed, you need to send it back to the main data center, right? Or core network. Similarly, on the EPC, you need to have a a, a concept of trying to filter out which application is on the edge and, and service them or send it to the data center. 
So we support these deployments in our uh, SDK. So with 5G, the good thing is um, Edge Cloud is officially a network function in the network, which means that an Edge Cloud platform needs to interact with other 3GPP network <coughs> elements, which includes next generation core, and it might also include G Node B and uh, uh, um, and other components of like control plane components of next next generation core. So in 5G, we are upgrading our SDK to support this uh, deployment. And the big architecture change here is that uh, the Edge Cloud platform, or in in 3GPP, what they call as AF or application function, needs to interact with uh, a couple of components in what next generation core uh, like uh, AMF and PCF these are the like you can con you can consider them as the control plane components of next generation core and configure what is here represented as UPF which is the user plane function so this user plane function as such can be considered as uh, uh, which which basically processes the user traffic and is not worried about the uh, control plane which is about the session management and billing and, uh, uh, and and subscriber information right so the you once once this uh, API or the interaction between the edge cloud and the next generation core happens then what happens is that the traffic from the G node B which is the next generation base station comes to your next generation core and all those traffic that are meant to be serviced on the edge will be diverted towards the edge cloud. Otherwise, the next generation core will send it to the normal data network. So here, the, uh, which means that the interaction here uh, is much more official and it's not ad hoc as in the 4G deployment. So looking a little bit deep into the architecture of our SDK and, uh, and, and trying to sort of uh, show the different areas of work we do and why we do this uh, is going to give you a, an impression of what you can achieve with this SDK. Right? So three main areas of work we do are, are in basically in the APIs right, and the data plane and the infrastructure optimization. So SDK APIs, when we work, when we started developing this for us, and even today, the reference for this is based on HCMEC. Why? Because HCMEC doesn't duplicate the work done in HCNFV, and we see in today's network that HCNFV or NFV-based deployments are being considered standard. So what all you consider as part of OpenStack based deployments are basically that are defined by HCNFV. So HCMEC takes advantage of the existing HCNFV, NFV deployments. So it, it, it was a reference for us to use and develop APIs. We are not saying we are 100% com compliant to these APIs, but we took that as a reference, right? And what we do is in this API, develop REST-based API and the infrastructure that is needed to onboard application, which is like authentication, authorization, service discovery, and notification sort of thing. So create that infrastructure so that for an application developer, it feels, I mean, it, they, they will know how it is different from a standard data center application compared to Edge and how these APIs are basically going to enable them to make this application much more agile or uh, to the next generation network or use cases. The next is the data plane. Data plane, as you know, the work that we have done for over the years on DPDK and other stuff. So uh, we have a very scalable data plane. For us, the key, here, key thing here is with data plane, to demonstrate how multi-core architecture can be used to scale from couple of gigs to 100 gigs using one or two cores and using our Intel NICs and also in future smart NICs and FPGA. And, and, and uh, these modules are very modular, so a customer who just wants to take 
data plane can just remove that library and use it in their solution and somebody who wants the API piece can, can reuse that. Lastly, the infrastructure piece. So, uh, you know, I mean, for us, Intel, the main thing is silicon. Silicon is the vehicle for us to gain the um, uh, application advantage uh, on, uh, on our architecture. And there is a lot of work every year that happens when, uh, when new generation or new microarchitecture comes up. So basically for us, in, in, in the division that where we work, which is wireless, all those silicon enhancements that happens on core, uncore, chipset, uh, FPGA, Intel NIC, and memory, all these devices, I mean all these components, we need to have a cohesive view of exposing this to edge cloud applications. And that's what we do here, right? And, and when, once we do this enhancement and they are exposed to, first of all, the standard OpenStack and Kubernetes of the world. And second thing is, it's also exposed from there to even ONAP and uh, orchestrators and also uh, uh, exposed to the application managers, which is the MEC manager here, which can use them to set policies, right? So we set policies here for, for example, using applications like four cores, dedicated cores with X amount of layer three cache. You can do that thing with our SDK and it's, that's a reference. So somebody use that as a template and they can implement that on a standard COT server based on IA. What is the role of Redis database? Uh, Redis database here is, uh, I mean, uh, you can see here it's highlighted as something which is not being developed here by us, but we are using Redis as a mechanism to store all the policies for an application. So an application can, uh, can be configured, for example, uh, let's say an application there is Netflix, and Netflix can, uh, can request for certain traffic from premium users to be diverted towards it when it receives the traffic from either the base station or core network. So in this Redis database, we are going to set, while provisioning the app, we are going to set a policy here, what are the services and traffic that Netflix application can actually request for, right? So whenever an interaction happens through that API, through the service registry, we are going to validate whether this application uh, has the capability to request for that service and only if it passes we are going to go ahead and that's where that's where all the database is stored yeah. I have a question yeah. so okay. uh, what is the latency reduction uh, compared to deploying of Mac application after the P gateway uh, or after the EPC stack uh, using the regular routing what you, what you, a developer can get in terms of like better latency uh, after a after P gateway, so it depends on the type of deployment. So we have seen uh, um, where core network is not centralized and it can be distributed. So, uh, uh, like for example, I was telling about this UPF or even CUPS model, where user plane can also sit on the next to the base station, and and also it, and in most of the days we are seeing the core network also getting virtualized. So uh, depending on the complexity or let's say what a operator or an enterprise wants to deploy if the base station or like for example you have a small cell and and uh, user plane function of core network and application all on the edge you will not see that much difference between having them on the edge and having a, a, a just on the s1 interface you know yeah i mean it would have been different if the core network was uh, always centralized but that has changed after release uh, 13, where CUPS has become a standard. Yeah. So you think we finished this? Yeah. Yeah, so this diagram shows the uh, overview of the VM based deployment where uh, we just talked about our services are part of the SDK, can be deployed in a VM. So all the traffic can go into that VM and gets distributed to various apps. 
So we support uh, cloud adapters from Amazon and Azure and also the standard Mac apps which can be like a CDN or ARVR apps. So this is based on uh, VM-based deployment and what you are seeing on the right hand side is based on cloud native or container deployment. The same services converted into what we call as microservices and deployed uh, uh, using Kubernetes. Docker container is our runtime on the node and, and the applications here are deployed as pods compared to uh, which are bare metal containers compared to virtual machines and the same APIs, uh, same experience happens here but the difference is if you have to set up that because of open stack complexities it might take you a couple of days to set up a data center here it might take around 20 to 25 minutes. But the overall uh, interface for application developer remains unchanged. So in order to achieve that sort of seamless, uh, uh, seamless behavior between VM deployment and bare metal container deployment, most of you might be aware um, uh, uh, most of you might be aware that container based uh, deployment for NFV is not that mature as VM-based deployment. It, it is becoming quite rapidly being adopted for NFV, but there are a lot of, lot of things that have been solved over the years for VM-based NFV deployments. And we had to turn this around on a cloud native deployment in less than two quarters. So all the let's say enhanced platform awareness work I mentioned about resource partitioning of uh, co core allocation, cache allocation, IO allocation, memory and SRIOV and uh, various uh, enhancements that are there in silicon which are available for you in OpenStack. We have to get the thing now on Kubernetes. Right? That's this chart showing all the work we have been doing over last two or three quarters and we are there today like I mean there are roadmaps for each of these projects and each of these projects have their repositories in github and and some of them are what we call as uh, uh, what we call as uh, you can see the node discovery function is a incubation project right and node discovery is for example uh, i mean it's a very good example to tell the the type of work we do uh, let's say an application developer wants to onboard a, a, um, a machine learning app which basically might use graphics but it can also run on core and that might use instructions like uh, AVX 512, AVX 512 if you are, AVX is a, a sort of a advanced inst instruction on Intel architecture. AVX 512 was the AVX uh, th 3 version of uh, instructions on Skylake uh, pr uh, processors which supports 512 bit vectors right and and uh, if we if applications re use these instructions we might want to discover before actually deploying the app if a particular platform supports that and that's the part of this uh, what we call as node feature discovery and all these projects or plugins for Kubernetes are now encapsulated and sort of exposed seamlessly to the application developers. That's what this SDK does. At its core, it is showing the goodness of IA and why, as I mean, just to repeat, Intel architecture is a architecture of choice for edge deployment. So a sample view of our APIs, this is in no way a full uh, view, but uh, for us, uh, this is an overview of MM5 where applications are deployed and what's the typical flow, right? So we are not worried about OSS and uh, Mobile Edge Orchestrator, which can be an own app orchestrator. So in our SDK, we have ME Manager and the MEC platform, which is the compute node and the application. So typically, the, 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 the response, uh, request and response here are based on REST API. 
uh, Mac manager sets the policy you can see here configures the request it and 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 the Redis database we talked about it sets all the policy once the policy is configured using the NFV infrastructure it can be either be uh, Kubernetes or it can be OpenStack. We spin up the app, app says it is live and then starts, once the live indication comes out, right then the application is ready to start processing packets. So it's quite straightforward and, and, and quite intuitive for application developers to understand what it takes in order to onboard an app. So once the app is up and running, you can see on the left hand side once it shows that it is live then it can request for notification so and it can discover service for example if it wants location service to 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 let uh, to 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 provide services to other users then it can discover that service and if location service is available on the platform it can subscribe to it and once it subscribes it can get periodic notification using push notification and all these are part of our SDK which is supported. Similarly on the right hand side you can see uh, it can request for certain traffic. So we support flexible data plane which supports for example an app can say send me all the traffic in this IP address range, send me all the traffic in this tunnel ID range, send me all the traffic that matches this port numbers. Right. So it's a very flexible data plane. And, and we look at, look, that in, look at that in the next slide. So once these rules are requested and they are, that, that matches the policy, we are going to add those rules to the data plane. Do you have any practical example of such application? Or how you would use those APIs so that you can facilitate the developers of, of uh, Mac applications to like, uh, learn by example? Yes, we have sample applications and we are in the process of adding more real world use cases. The SDK itself comes up, comes with sample applications, both for cloud native and, uh, and for VM based and for cloud adapters using Amazon Greengrass or, uh, or even Azure. And we are planning to onboard more real world applications that show use cases that uses Intel graphics or even some of the APIs. Do you envision like viewers, like a or something like that here? Pardon? Do you, do you envision applications like streaming video viewers? Yes, and, and I have an example at the end where we have done some field trial using our SDK and I have, we have some results there. So the question was if there are, if there are any applications that we have seen that use uh, transcoding, if I can use that term. Uh, as a use case and uh, yes and we will look at that as an example. Uh, so just a view of SDK and uh, we need not go through this in detail but what we are showing here is to show that our SDK has the data plane which is modular, very intuitive and standard computer science scatter gather method and which easily can be mapped to any network, inter net network interface that supports DPDK. And, and also can scale on a multi-core architecture, right? So on the upstream, when we receive the packets, we distribute it using the various protocols onto high-speed rings. And these rings can be software rings or hardware rings. And once that is segregated, then we identify which is the target application, and then we forward the traffic. Similarly happens on downstream, we also support multiple, multiple local breakout. Local breakout is if an app onboarded onto the SDK cannot, let's say either for compute reasons or for other restrictions, cannot service the application in the VM, can send the traffic to a local breakout, again which is sort of policy controlled. And in that local breakout, it can do the heavy lifting of processing and which has a bigger compute resource. So, the basic thing that we wanted to convey through this slide is that it's a scalable data plane and, and which can easily be mapped. So we have roadmap of, uh, and if you have heard of this Intel DDP, which is a dynamic device profile, where using Fort Will and next generation Intel Next, you can configure advanced filters on Intel Next. 
and these advanced filters have standard phi tuple and also go beyond that and you can give a particular pattern in the packet. So we, we can map these for the edge and do like 60 to 70 percent of your edge net packet processing completely on the NIC which means that you have more cores left for application developers. Right. So that's the scalability we wanted to show and, and, and the performance numbers from our data plane show that we can reach line rate for our 10 and 40 gig NIC uh, beyond 512 byte packet uh, using one of the uh, I.O. cores and uh, or in, in case like where you have lookup and I.O. we have two cores for doing that completely in software and that further reduces if you offload it to your NIC or smart NIC. So this is the architecture that we are supporting for cloud uh, so CSP uh, where uh, we support onboarding of um, the apps or the IoT gateways from uh, 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 Microsoft Azure and also Greengrass. So what this basically does is in our SDK all the edge cloud APIs are supported in the, uh, on the platform. So IoT is just for, as an example, let's take a scenario where you have a, a mall where are, there are three types of IoT devices, right? Vending machines, thermal sensors, and security cameras. Today, these are the three, I mean, typically these kind of devices where, uh, 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 where for edge processing, you would use typically Azure or Greengrass. So you have a dedicated hardware in the mall which does that security surveillance and that's a dedicated hardware. Let's use uh, Greengrass as an example. So you have a Greengrass core, dedicated hardware sitting on the mall, which is doing your processing. And when it sees an anomaly, it sends the packet to the cloud uh, where uh, the, 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 because of the detection of this anomaly, then some action can be taken. So that's the concept of uh, 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 Azure or uh, Greengrass and typically they are deployed on, ed, uh, on a dedicated hardware today So what we and, and they are not edge cloud apps. So what we did is we developed these Lambda functions for uh, Amazon Greengrass and also modules that uh, similar to Lambda functions which basically does all the edge cloud APIs and configuration. So any any applications today that are existing, Greengrass application today, can import this Lambda functions or modules. Once they import it and they onboard it uh, onto a Mac uh, platform, these Lambda functions call the API, and all of a sudden your Greengrass is now becoming has become a virtualized instance. It need not be on a dedicated hardware, and it's also an edge cloud app and it can coexist with your CDN or ARVR app, right? And, and uh, we have also, this also works in both cloud native world and VM world, and also means that on a multi-core architecture, different, um, let's say, edge cloud vendors can be consolidated on the same platform. And also, they can consume resources from other applications, which is a new sort of use case from, uh, from, 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 from this work. So compute reuse and also sharing of uh, resources and also uh, sort of a service model where the IoT gateways can get service from other applications the edge. So for the mall scenario, you will have three VMs, one for thermal sensors, one for uh, vending machines and another one for your uh, uh, security cameras coexisting on the same platform as a virtualized instance. So, um, just to look, have a look, quick look at the roadmap, so uh, uh, we were talking about other apps, we are planning to start supporting OpenVINO, this is the, um, uh, this is the uh, work that is happening on the uh, IOTG group in, in, in Intel. Uh, basically, uh, a, a, a op OpenVINO enables um, uh, next generation API for your machine learning and AI and, 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 and we are 
supporting out of the box in SDK that is happening in the second half of this year and uh, and, and supporting FPGA uh, for uh, FPGA for uh, offloads from the applications uh, uh, more and, and uh, uh, which is automotive. automotive so, so we, are, we are, working are working with different, different groups within Intel, Intel which, which are basically servicing various verticals and get, getting all, all those ingredients as part of Edge Cloud, cloud so that we, we become, become an FSM architecture which exposes all these functionalities to the adaptive developers. And that's, that's what work is basically happening in the second half and, and, the, and, and the five, five years which, which we went through in the, in the Q1, Q1 of next year. year. Yeah. 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 So, so uh, the different, different use cases, cases for example, uh, uh, we'll go through this. Uh, the five, five use cases, cases here, you can see the where all edge can, edge can play a role. Right? Right? And this is an automotive use case. case. Uh, uh, we, we have, have seen uh, our interaction with the customer where edge plays a key role in uh, um, mobile, mobile tuning, tuning and, and AI. I mean, uh, we, we have heard about, about this uh, BBI uh, uh, and, and also entertainment and infotainment within the vehicles. Uh, where edge can play a key role uh, traffic management hd maps hd maps is one of the really widely used use case for edge where multiple uh, uh, let's say uh, uh, automotive vendors can reuse the service of a single hd map service vendor and provide the mapping experience to various vehicles right and uh, over, uh, over the air update of firmware using car sync, parking management, uh, and, and cameras and parking presence. So these are some of the use cases where edge deployment plays a key role. And, uh, and, and this is even with some of the 4G work that has been happening today. And, and it is going to definitely have a, a use case with 5G because of uh, uh, new radio access technologies coming in the form of uh, uh, millimeter wave and also ultra low latency. So this is one of the trials uh, that we had done uh, with Smart Stadium in, 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 in uh, China and Shanghai in Mercedes-Benz Arena. So what you can see here is in the stadium you have users uh, and, and basically small cells are being used uh, uh, and to service the users. Um, uh, this China Unicom network. Uh, so one, there are two outcomes from this deployment. One is um, the stadium audience. Uh, basically, they, can, uh, they are basically able to enjoy the various angles of, uh, of the game that is happening. In re I mean, almost in real time, you can see here at 0.5 seconds latency, uh, and they can have this instant replays and uh, uh, stuff like that very quickly, right? And this is all happening within the arena on the edge, so that the traffic is not going all the way to the big data center to get transcoded. This was the example that you are asking for, transcoded, and 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 it, even we are servicing at 4K. Uh, or, or high definition. And another use case from this is uh, because of edge compute, uh, 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 so the general, so one of the deployments here is if you want to have, uh, 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 if you want to have live transmission or live video over the standard network compared to the edge compute network, the difference here we are showing is around 30 seconds, right? So the typical delay that you it would the, the user would experience of what is happening in the in in the arena compared to what uh, he would see the user in in uh, if it traverses through the standard network compared to if you are processing on the edge and let's say he is the edge user or a premium user and he is serviced through this edge network he would see a difference of 30 seconds, right? So this is something which is in the real world that is deployed, measured, and, and, and we know the impact, right? So, um, sure, yeah, go ahead. So, so the decode happened over on the 
you set off, you know, at the like a, at the stadium, right? So from wherever the, the content was being shipped, yes. it was encoded, decoded there, and then broadcasted at 4K wireless? Yeah, so the uh, let's say the transcoding happens here once the capture happens, and the decoding happens at the user device. Where they are actually viewing the uh, uh, viewing the content, yeah. Well, what's it, so it's being live transcoded. Yes. I see. Yeah. Sounds like a lot of spying. That thirty-second delay sounds like a lot of spying going on. So I would say uh, that delay is basically because of a couple of things. One is the network complexity. The second is is about the, uh, let's say, you, ha you have to compete over other traffic that is happening on the network, right? And there might be various reasons why that 30 second happens. But I would say what edge compute enables here is basically to filter out the rest of the noise because you are provisioning this particular use case for this particular amount of time when that, uh, let's say, the event is happening in the arena and you are servicing on the edge. So you definitely have an SLA. So that 30 second you might be seeing might be the worst case scenario, but here you always get consistent and standard, let's say, uh, service delivery to the user. So what, what, what was the latency for the uh, internet audience uh, uh, which uh, was connected uh, after the EPC that uh, the straight line from the... Uh, uh, the That's over the standard internet. So there is no SGI as such user here. We are we are we are not measuring here anything here. Oh, I see. Yeah. So I have a question on that. So you are saying that we do capture the video, live video, do transcoding and display it, and then we will do the decode on the client devices. Uh, the client devices can be very different. So um, meaning I might actually. Um, it's a very good question. Okay, you might be watching. Yes, yeah, that's a very good question. So how do you handle that at the, at the streaming server? This is what Edge can do, right? So if you are here sit, sitting with your old CRT TV or very new 4K TV, what you get is what you get. And you don't have a choice. With Edge, and this is one of the demos that we had done in MWC, I think two years back, where user-specific information can be provided here, right? And we provided, we had three different types of smartphones. One is very old, one is very latest, one is something in between. And that capability can be fed to this edge compute. So depending on the user device, he either gets 720p or 1080p or 4K. And this is per user. So this particular, I don't have the uh, number for how many streams that it is. So were you, were you using any of the um, CPUs uh, encoding decoding capabilities? Yes, yeah, we did. We did use the CPU for here, uh, for the edge, cl edge cloud where this encode capabilities was happening. So yeah, and even the VNFs were running on the so Xeon the servers. Was done it was done on CPU, not dedicated hardware. Uh, Yes. What yes. was the codec? Uh, I mean, I, I don't have the I don't have the codec. What type it was? So you're not using any of the x86s and decoding capabilities. It is based on software x86 okay. instructions. Yes. How did you get this 4K uh, video from cameras to to the device uh, to to the to the encoder? Pardon? How you got the traffic from camera to the encoder? Small cells. I mean, from cameras, cam cameras. Uh, if we, if we give you 4K, yeah, uh, what kind of... So the cameras will also be connected over 4K, I mean, or yeah, LTE. What, what is the connection between camera and the encoder? Yeah, yeah, so the, cam the cameras will also be connected over LTE, which feeds the content to the edge cloud, right? So the cameras and the users can all be in the LTE network. The, the camera is probably compressing right in the camera and sending out that video. Yeah, so it could do that as well, right? So depending on depending on the type of deployment, the cameras could do some of the processing here, 
right? But they are they they are the devices that are connected over LTE, like a producer device, and users are the consumer devices. In some cases, you can also have this as wire line. You can have a Ethernet feeding to your router. Yeah, I mean, in, in your particular case, uh, which you're describing, uh, was in, you, you mentioned that encoder was uh, software. So what I'm asking is, how the data from camera came to the encoder? How the data from camera came to the encoder? Set a file format, so it's not going to make a difference. Yeah, I mean, I mean the, the amount of traffic for, for 4K is, is, is relatively high. That's what I'm like, trying to figure out. I'm surprised the encoder is in the camera itself. Yeah, it be sending raw video. Yeah, so, so, I mean, uh, for, for, for this example, in the sense that depending on the bandwidth, yeah, you can have this to be wireline or wireless. That's yeah, right. but you, you, for, for that, you, you, have, you, you make this uh, on, on, on real deployment, so you use something. So that, oh, for this, yes, for you this can see the router, so that's why it's wireline. For, for this use case where you see 30 seconds delay, the cameras are getting the contents to the edge server or wireline. So how many cameras and what kind of cameras do you use? Huh. I don't have that information. Okay. So, uh, we talked about or we heard in today's talk about various complexities with edge deployment. We also heard from uh, uh, Oath about use cases with edge. Uh, but uh, what we are seeing with interacting with customers and also operators uh, basically is that this is moving from hype that about edge to real deployments and these are the various verticals that we are seeing where real deployments and trials are happening right there is no more ask for a killer app or why we need to do edge it is happening and, and it is happening for um, let's say in, in cases where uh, the changes are basically uh, in, in less variable scenarios like enterprise or smart uh, stadiums where you can have less variability and we see that becoming more pervasive in 5G deployments. Right? And that's where I wanted to conclude and basically we wanted to make sure that the SDK um, uh, enables such trials for various of the various verticals and as SDK users you can expect uh, the features that enable application developers to use Intel ingredients to target these verticals. Thank you. Do we have time for questions? Oh, sure. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. And then we have a few prizes. We already had a few questions, but maybe a couple more. So are you going to make the slides available? Yes. Yep. They will be posted on SlideShare. So will you be able to provide more information on your stadium trial? More details on what type of cameras you are using and how many things like that? We would need to check if, it is, if there is a white paper for that, but this is something which was publicly conducted. So. If you can drop a mail to uh, one of our Intel colleagues, so we can try to answer that question. You can send your questions to Sujata and she'll forward it to us. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so we have our registration and our survey drawing to do. Thank you. Did you give a